Luca, father. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Councilmember Jose Rizar. I am joined today by Park Recorian. Uh, this is a meeting of the Planning, Land Use, and Management Committee. Our chair cannot be with us today. And do we have the public comment cards, please? Okay. So are you there? Are, they're behind, right? Okay. So if we could have items number four and five on consent, and item number seven will be continued. If that's okay with my colleague, Mr. Kikorian, four and five consent. And uh, number f seven uh, will be continued in plum to, uh, to 52510. Number seven is continued till May the 25th. So those are those items. And before we begin, uh, the city attorney has a comment regarding item number two. Uh, which is uh, deals with the city's density bonus law. And the city attorney, if you could make an announcement, please. Terry Kaufman, Macias City Attorney's Office. Um, I understand that there are people who submitted um, speaker cards on item two, um, and I want to explain the procedure um, and discuss where it's appropriate for you to make whatever comments you want to make if they're general comments to the density bonus ordinance. The only thing that is on the agenda um, regarding the city's ordinance, the only thing that's on the agenda today are two changes that are required by um, a court order in a case that the city handled. Um, and I can explain more about that when the case comes up. Um, that means that items, um, that uh, comments that, that uh, members of the public may have about the density bonus law in general or changes that they might like to see to that law are not appropriate under item two. Those comments can, however, be made at the public comment period. Um, so um, when, the, when the chair calls the case, um, if your comment relates to density bonus law in general, I'll, I'll stop you and say please make your comments at, at um, the public comment period and not on this item. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up on that. Yeah. So bottom line, uh, at the city attorney's recommendation, if anyone has anything to say about the density bonus law in general, you could speak to that item under public comment. Otherwise, item number two deals specifically with those two sections of the ordinance that uh, we will discuss today. Okay. So uh, anyone who wants to fill out a speaker's card, you could come up to the young lady over here at the end behind the clock. We'll go from there. So first item, uh, we will first go to item number eight, the director of planning. Uh, so, uh, well, let's go to Roberto, item number eight. Uh, yes, council member number eight is uh, Ms. Goldberg's status report. Thank you very much. Uh, council members, I thought that uh, I would like to come today, first of all, to thank you very much for the action that the council took last week to adopt a 3% surcharge to help the city planning department continue our work on maintaining our general plan and our community plan program. And I wanted to tell you that when we combine this new fee with the fee ordinance that you adopted a few months ago for case processing. It means that we have successfully replaced in our budget about five million dollars annually of general fund money with fees that, uh, that serve a particular purpose and so it will be a fee for service. This five million dollars combined with your adoption of a trust fund that allows us to not only put these fee monies into a protected fund, but it also will protect all of the money that we currently receive that is reimbursable for services rendered like our EIRs, like our expedite, 
or when we have special fee agreements for large projects. What this will do for the planning department is that this year we have a budget that is 100% general fund. Next year's budget will be 75% special fund and only 25% general fund. This is a huge structural change that will, I believe, make the planning department less vulnerable to the ups and downs of the general fund and will secure the services that both the community and the developers want. So we believe this is a big win for us and for the city in general. We want to also share with you that our department aggressively goes after grant funds. Over the past four years, we have successfully brought in more than $5 million in grants that augment the work that we're doing on community plans. But last month, it was announced by the county, and you probably saw the big uh, press conference that the county had received um, almost $30 million in funds and stimulus grant money. And I wanted to share with you that the planning department had partnered with the county in their Healthy Communities Grant Program, and the planning department will receive $1.75 million that we will use over the next two years that will help us to work on transit-oriented development, create more walkable communities, and this too will augment our community planning program. So we are, um, we are feeling pretty successful in terms of doing what we believe uh, you all want us to do to be, make us less dependent upon the general fund and secure services. Um, this Friday will be the last day for the last wave of early retirements in the planning department. And so at the end of Friday, this will be, this will represent 50 people leaving the department over the last five months. 50 bodies, 50 experienced planners or support staff that will have left. And when you combine that with the loss of FTEs or full-time equivalents through our, um, our furlough program, we have lost just since the beginning of this year seven, the equivalent of 73 people in our department. So. Um, we are, we are struggling but working hard and believe that we are making progress to become a much more sustainable department. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any questions, Mr. Kukari? No? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Goldberg. Uh, thank you for the report. And certainly, uh, given our fiscal situation, the city seems like uh, all our departments are um, taking a hit, uh, but it seems that the planning department certainly has had a large share of those who are, are leaving. So thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. Next item, Mr. Mejia. Uh, next item, Councilman, is item one, which is a report from the mayor. It's relative to the appointment of Mr. Christopher Lee to the West LA APC. Mr. Lee, welcome. Good afternoon. And uh, well, congratulations on your nomination to serve on the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission. And if you could just tell the panel briefly your interest in serving on this planning commission. Uh, I think one of my uh, purposes to figure out or assist the other members in how to create jobs, and I'll be totally open-minded pro-business, and I, I guess we have to be very sensitive to this, the community and traffic on whoever. So today is my first day, so I come with an open mind and figure out how I could be a good servant to the city. Okay, great. Thank you. And you have an impressive background here, having uh, served in a number of areas that have, uh, where well, you've been a consultant for financial firms, and um, I think that it will serve well in terms of providing uh, that perspective on planning decisions. And so, welcome, and Mr. Krikorian. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, well, with that, I'll move to uh, approve the nomination. And do we know when this will be before full council? 
I believe it's April the 9th, Councilman. Okay. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for we'll your time. Council. Thank you for Congratulations. Time. Next item. Uh, item two, Council Members, is a City Attorney report on a draft ordinance uh, making technical corrections to two sections of the City's density bonus uh, ordinance. Uh, yes, uh, Deputy City Attorney Ken Fong. Uh, several years ago, the uh, city, as required by state law, adopted an implementing ordinance to implement the state density bonus law. We were challenged in court, and the court upheld the vast majority of the city's implementing ordinance, except for these two relatively minor provisions, which were additions that went above and beyond the state law, and the reason why the planning department had added them was because they made more sense for a large city like City of Los Angeles. But the, uh, the court ruled that because we had only used a categorical exemption that the CEQA analysis was insufficient. And so the court ordered uh, the city either to do a further CEQA analysis uh, if it wanted to add those two uh, provisions to keep them or just to remove them. So this ordinance, it, be, because the two provisions have not been uh, used uh, by applicants, uh, the planning uh, department uh, is recommending that they simply be removed. And that's what this ordinance does today. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kukai, any questions now, or would you like to go to uh, public comment first? Uh, to you. Yeah, Can you push your button to speak? Yeah. Sorry, one question now and probably more later. Uh, but you, you mentioned in your opening comments that the vast majority of the implementing ordinance was affirmed or upheld by the court. Yes, that's right. W were all elements of the implementing ordinance actually challenged as part of the litigation? Or were, was the litigation directed at the, uh, the elements that we're considering re removing today? Actually, originally, the lawsuit challenged other provisions uh, of the uh, implementing ordinance, and, and those provisions were actually reflective of state law. And as the litigation developed, uh, it became apparent to the court that these two provisions that you have in front of you today went above and beyond the state law. So that's why the judge decided these are the only two provisions that go above and beyond the state law. That's why I'm deciding that um, you didn't do a sufficient CEQA analysis. With respect to the, uh, the rest of the implementing ordinance, the court decided that the city did not have to do any CEQA analysis because it was already state law. And because it was existing state law, uh, our adoption of those same provisions would not affect any environmental change. Okay. It, it, would it be accurate to say that the other provision, that the court found that the other provisions were consistent with the state law and yes. therefore didn't require uh, further CEQA consideration? Yes, yes, that, that, that's correct. But and not necessarily uh, mandated by state law? No. That, that wasn't a part of the court's no, it, decision? The other provisions are mandated by state law. In fact, they are the state law, and the, the rest of the implementing ordinance the primary purpose of the implementing ordinance is to set in place procedures for accepting and processing density bonus applications because the state law was silent on that. Uh, I think the state legislature knew that you know, every city has its own set of procedures and they wanted each city and each county to be free to adopt its own procedures. And so that's basically what the implementing ordinance does. But the substantive law is the same as in the state law. Okay. I, we'll come back to this later. Thank you. Thank you. Lucille Sanders is our first public speaker. And after Lucille is Barbara Monahan burke Welcome. I'll be in public comment. Thank you. Public comment. Okay. Next speaker is Barbara Monahan burke Barbara Monahan Burke, Studio City Neighborhood Council Board Member. Um, first, I want you to know that we as a neighborhood council do have 
many motions and CIS's community impact statements on file to do with um, the state SB 1818 and also the proposed LA SB 1818. And so we will get those to you soon. It's been a holiday weekend and also it was hard to provide everything because this goes back for years. We have to make sure we're accurate. I have two points. One, I believe very strongly that a CEQA study should be done for um, this, this proposal. I th and in working with it through the years, um, we find it's disastrous to do with its effect on um, Studio City and its scale, its character, quality of life, all of that, trees, trees, air, water, everything it affects to do with our health, welfare, safety, the environment, and it um, hugely impacts the infrastructure, which is not even enough for what we are having to have now. So we strongly uh, do want CEQA study. Um, the second thing is, uh, I believe this will come into play at some point, and uh, Council Member Kerkorian, you were not here, but um, uh, Council Member uh, Reyes, you, um, Wezar, you were. Um, when the housing element was passed um, uh, last year to do with LA, and four goals of that housing element um, were, were changed, and yet mistakenly um, Council Member Reyes assured the Council Members at that time that nothing was changed to do with the goals, and those goals are major, major law. So we do have to go back and review what was changed because it would affect how you look at SB 1818, and I will get our review of that, which we did to your committee so you can review that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Barry Johnson. After Mr. Johnson is Lisa Sarkin. Barry Johnson, Studio City Stakeholder. Um, I don't understand how there can be a categorical exemption from CEQA with this from the beginning. Um, in Studio City, we're trying to get an RFA passed at this time, and we've been told that CEQA is required. This is an ordinance that would, in effect, have less building on properties. Yet, this, the um, SB 1818 implementing ordinance allows greater building on properties. It seems like there's a double standard here that I don't understand. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Yes, would you like Secretary. me to answer that question? Terry Kaufman, Messiah City Attorney's Office. I think the, there's a, a misunderstanding about what the ordinance is doing today. These two provisions were part of the city's uh, original implementing ordinance, and the court said and, and they were adopted with a categorical exemption. The court said because these were outside state law, a categorical exemption was, was not sufficient. So that's really consistent with what you're saying. In other words, if the city wanted to do, add these provisions, they would have to do it with some additional environmental clearance, some greater evaluation. All that's happening today is those provisions that shouldn't have been adopted with a categorical exemption are being removed. It's not adding more opportunity for density bonus units that, that than we already have in the law. So that's, that's the difference. Thank you. And the two sections we're speaking about are Section 25C3. That's the for sale or rental senior housing with low, very low income units. And Section 25C4, for sale housing with moderate income units. And if anyone chooses to use those two sections for development, they would now be required to do a sequel review. Is that correct? No, because no? because the court said we had to take them out. I mean, if, if you want to add them in and do some additional analysis, you, you could do that. But right now, we're just taking them out. Yeah, yeah, Ken Fong, maybe I'll just add a little bit. Yeah, um, we're not the uh, the section on senior housing that's being removed in its entirety because that does not exist in state okay. law the uh, section on moderate income that does exist in state law but we're modifying it so that it exactly tracks what state law is so those, those are the two changes and if somebody chooses to use that 
that's the latter one, it will not require secret review. No, it, it won't, because it'll exactly be the same as state law, law and the court not, decided that state law doesn't require any sequel analysis at all, because that, that law is already in place. Okay, thank you. Barry Johnson just spoke. Uh, Lisa Sarkin. Lisa Sarkin, Studio City Neighborhood Council. I, I too have a question now because I don't want to speak out of turn for the wrong thing here. And I think that Councilmember Wazer has the same question. I, I really don't understand when CEQA actually has to be used or if it ever does with our implementing ordinance. Maybe you could explain that too. Well, I guess Ken can, can add to it, okay. but there, there's, go, go there's a difference between somebody coming in for a project and the, and the CEQA clearance that's used for a project versus the CEQA clearance that was used for the ordinance. So if you want to... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ken, Ken Fong here. I, I would just add that, um, again, that because this is a state law that will exist, even if the city doesn't enact any implementing ordinance at all, the state law is already in place and effective, so whatever environmental change uh, would have occurred from the state law has already taken place. Mm -hmm. Got it. Doug Haynes. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm a member of the East Hollywood Neighborhood Council. In deference to Madam City Attorney, I'll retain the bulk of my comments for the public comment period, but I would like to state on the issue of CEQA, when planning staff analyzes the individual impacts of a project, as in the case we have right now at Fountain and Gower in Hollywood, they really don't assess in a way that would show the significant inverse impact that could um, lead to the density bonus being rejected. In the case of the Fountain and Gower project, which is going to be before the City Planning Commission on Thursday under appeal, planning uh, say, stated that they assessed the impact of this 56-foot tall building, which is directly next to a 12-foot residential home, under aesthetics and height, even though the applicant showed in the shade shadow study that there'd be a significant impact. Excuse me, uh, Terry Coppin, CS City Attorney's Office. Mr. Haynes, it's not the matter that's in I'm front discussing of. I'm discussing CEQA. If you, but it's not CEQA related to this item. If you want to incorporate that into your specific general public comments, you can do that. Um, and I don't even know if, if, I think that project is coming. It's before uh, City yeah, Planning yeah, Commission yeah. this Thursday. And then potentially before this. Yeah, and those, and the people who are, um, uh, the applicant for that project isn't here, so it's it's really not oh, appropriate for you. My to comment was that the mitigation measure by planning was to put vegetation in for uh, shade shadow. Well, that is a project that actually will be before the city planning commission this Thursday, and then if appealed before this body here, the planning and land use management committee, the city council. Just so I, I do not believe that we can hear testimony on the item without it being publicly ad properly advertised for everyone to have the ability to comment. Anyway. I'll retain the rest for public comment. Thank you, sir. Next. Yes. Can I just have clarification on that one point? Because if if, if the, a member of the public wants to comment on something that's within the jurisdiction of this committee, um, that doesn't make a testimony. And so I, I understand that this is not the time for that because this is a specific item that's not it's not the matter that the gentleman was talking about. But certainly during general public comment, he can comment about that project or any other project that he feels that he wants to comment upon, can he? Yes. Terry Kaufman, Macias City Attorney's Office. Uh, my, my feeling is that, that legally, no, because then you're going to be taking testimony ahead of time without the rest of the public being here on that item, including the applicant, they won't be privy to that. And then you're, you're going to hear that testimony and, and hear whatever complaints there are um, before the item comes to you. Okay. And then it's going to come to you again. So I would say no, that's not appropriate. Well, well, let me rule as a chair that under public comment, it's my belief that people could speak to any item or anything they wish to address this panel on. So if the individual wants to speak in public comment, about that one particular project, I think he has the right to do so. But right now we do have another item before us, so he couldn't speak on that item now. So 
And he does have a card in for public comment, Mr. Kokorian. So thank you for raising that. Uh, Kerry Brazenman. I'm, I'm going to wait for uh, public comment. OK. Next speaker is Michael McHugh. Michael McHugh, Studio City Neighborhood Council Board Member. Um, I represent the renters on the Studio City Neighborhood Council, so naturally I've been involved with this issue for quite some time, as well as Barbara and Barry and Lisa and I, we've been commenting on SB 18 quite a bit over the years. And I think one of the things that we want to impress upon you in a general way is that first, it, it's been very sluggish getting the city to create the implementing ordinance. And this has been a, a very painful, long drawn out uh, process. These two items that have been rejected by the court, what I think we would like everyone in this committee to really understand is that we don't want you to just fix two items because the court rejected it and so that you are in compliance with the overall state law, which we feel is unfair to begin with, and tries to trump all of the jurisdictions within the state of California and has and, and is been unfair from the beginning, in my personal opinion. What we want you to do is to fix everything about it before you send it to city council, not just these two items. Other things, such as public notification of the people who are not just immediately abutting the property that's receiving a density bonus, but are within the range of the area, just like you would with anything else that, uh, that where a density bonus is being allowed. I, I hope you were hearing what Barbara said about, and what Lisa said about how this is really destroyed our community. We have lost hundreds and hundreds of rent stabilized units. Uh, the people in the Magnolia Project, many of whom were my friends, have moved three or four times since they were kicked out of there. And what is sitting there now? Nothing. You know, we want you to fix everything about this. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Diane Rosen. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Rosen, Chair of the Planning and Land Use Committee of the Encino Neighborhood Council. Uh, we uh, feel that one size doesn't fit all in this uh, ordinance. We have to consider that the valley is different. It's different than the urban uh, areas that this was probably designed for. We do have urban areas that, that need to be uh, reworked. But this has come into Encino in the most uh, obnoxious manner. There was property on one of the main boulevards, and six homes, three on each side of the street, were uh, inconsistent with the plan that was redone. They, they're individual homes. They were on large lots and a very expensive neighborhood. It was a property of opportunity is what it's called. And uh, a developer went in there, purchased a house, uh, gave a story to, the, it was in probate, gave a story that was uh, uh, not so. And developed, came in and wanted to put a four-story, 15-unit subterranean building under SB 1818. It was rezoned later uh, to be conforming. But this is a neighborhood of ranch styles, very expensive, one of the most exclusive areas in the valley. And it was just going to be ripped apart. And it finally took a lawsuit. And it's still uh, not a good conclusion, although it's been settled. So it was all done under SB 1818 with a bo bonus, density bonus. And this is something that we need, all right, uh, thank you. We need to address one size doesn't fit all. Great, thank you very much. So um, question for the city attorney's office. As I understand it then, what we are doing today is making some 
changes to the density law, the city's density bonus law, that will fit with the court settlements on. Well, yeah, on it's, this a, it's, matter, a, right? it's a court ruling. The court basically has ordered the city to delete the two provisions that go above and beyond the state law. So once, if you approve these changes, they will remove that language that goes above and beyond the state law, and the, the city's implementing ordinance substantive provisions will be exactly the same as the state I law. I thought we were deleting one and amending the other. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But, so but you're amending the second one so that it'll be exactly the same as the state law. And so why are we deleting that first one and not amending it? Because it doesn't exist at all in state law. It doesn't law. exist at all in state no. law. Okay, got it. And so the second one's going to be consistent with state law. That's correct. Okay, and have we to date uh, have any projects that have applied under these two uh, uh, planning department can sections? speak to that, but my understanding was that we had that they had not had any projects. No one's used these sections. That's right. Okay, so we're not going to correct. Uh, no, we have not had any applications for these. We haven't used them. No. Okay. Great. Any other questions, Mr. Corey? No, I, I don't think I have any other questions. I think I understand what we're, we're doing here uh, today uh, clearly. Um, but I do think that uh, Ms. Rosen said that one size doesn't fit all uh, within the city, and she's certainly right. I think um, I also believe that one size doesn't fit all for statewide legislation. And the underlying legislation that we're, we're discussing here, I think it can appropriately be said that one size doesn't fit all in Los Angeles compared to Modesto, compared to San Diego and throughout the state. Um, and and I, I do think the more I learn about it, the more I realize uh, clearly how we do need to try to address some of the inequities that result from this underlying state law. But in the meantime, until that happens, um, I certainly want us to make take every step that we can to ensure that the city does not do anything to further exacerbate the damage that SB 1818 has caused to so many communities. And I think this court order produ produces a an opportunity to begin that discussion. Uh, now may not be the time to have that discussion, and uh, and I, I don't think we need to, because as I understand it, we can make these revisions, come back next month, two months from now, with further revisions. We can continue to revise the implementing ordinance ad infinitum, if we wish. And there's nothing that prevents us from doing that by taking these steps today. And so uh, in, in light of that, I, I appreciate Mr. McHugh's comments that we want to get it all done now, but it's not necessary to get it all done now. We, we should make the changes that we need to do now to be compliant uh, with the state law and to eliminate the additional opportunities that we've given to developers to take advantage of, of this statute. Uh, and then I think we need to come back and further revisit how we can make an implementing ordinance more effective in protecting the interests of communities uh, and not just of developers who want to continue to add density. So um, today may not be the time to do all of that, uh, but I just want to make real clear that I'm going to have a strong interest in continuing that dialogue as we move forward after we approve the, uh, the recommendation that's before us today. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. So with that, I'll move that we adopt this item as presented by the city attorney and move it to full council. Second. Okay. Second by Mr. Krikorian, so ordered. And before we continue, I do want to mention that, uh, as Ms. Goldberg mentioned earlier, that we have a number of people leaving the planning department. Amongst them is uh, a senior planner. Uh, she's the acting deputy director, uh, Jane Blumenfeld, and we want to wish you luck and a great retirement. You've worked uh, on a number of key city initiatives in the planning department. We are sad to see you go, but happy for you to enjoy your retirement. So congratulations and thank you, Jane Blumenfeld, for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Mr. Uh, so, so Councilman, uh, for clarity, item two, you approve the city attorney ordinance. Yes. Okay. Yes. And item three, council members, again, it's a city attorney ordinance, uh, amending sections of the municipal code to extend the life of subdivision map act, maps in the city. Okay. 
Is staff here on that item? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Rothman with the Planning Department. I'm here today to present an ordinance implementing Assembly Bill 333. Uh, AB 333 was approved by the state legislature on July 15th of 2009 and assists applicants of housing projects who are experiencing financing, financial difficulties during the recession. Specifically, the bill extends for two years the life of tracked and parcel maps that are set to expire between July 15th of 2009 and January 1 of 2012. This extension is in addition to a one-year extension previously um, provided by Senate Bill 1185 that was adopted by City Council on April 15th of last year. Prior to these two state laws, track maps and parcel maps had to be recorded with the county within three years of a city approval. When SB 1185 became effective, it increased the life from three years to four years for maps set to expire between July 15th of 2008 and January 1 of 2011. With this new ordinance, AB 333 further extends those, those maps for an additional two years for those between July 15th, 2009 and January 1, 2012. The combination of SB 1185 and AB 333 increases the life of those track maps and parcel maps by different amounts depending upon their expiration date. So before you today, um, this ordinance addresses four points. One, it implements the intent of AB 333 by increasing the initial expiration period for tracks in that window for an additional two years. It goes further than state law by extending the life of related entitlements by the same two years. It makes some minor technical corrections to the zoning code. And lastly, it includes an emergency clause to have this ordinance effective as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, you just caught my ear in light of the discussion we just had about SB 1818. You said that this ordinance goes beyond the scope of what was required by these two state bills, but I didn't catch in what respect uh, it, it goes beyond what's required sure. by state law. Um, sometimes when we have track maps and parcel maps, there are other related entitlements, like a variance or a conditional use permit or a, or a coastal development permit. Um, since this act, since the AB 333, extends the life of the track map by two years, um, if there was a variance not keeping, keep, keeping pace with it, then the whole project would uh, become uh, moot within, uh, if, if it, that entitlement wasn't extended also. It doesn't modify the time extension. Oh, no, not at all. Okay. No. Okay, very good. It keeps them in pace with each other. And that just wasn't discussed in the state legislation, correct? Correct. The, the state okay. legislation specifically addressed only subdivision maps. Okay, the additional entitlements weren't discussed. Okay. All right, with that, uh, there's no cards on this item. Uh, motion to approve. Is there a second? So moved. So ordered. Thank you very much. Okay. Next item. The next item, Councilman, would be item 6, which is an appeal by the Foothill Enterprises Limited Partnership. And it has to do with the action of the City Planning Commission, which approved a recycling buyback center in CD7. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councilman. Tom Glick, City Planning Department. Uh, I'm sorry, I just got pulled by the appellant out because he didn't understand what was going on here today. So, um, but my role here today is just to represent City Planning Commission's action, which was in December of 2009, City Planning Commission issued their determination approving this buyback recycling center at 11910 Foothill Boulevard in Sunland. Um, commission, in making their approval, um, imposed several conditions which they felt would um, provide the necessary mitigations that a buyback center technically would create. Uh, while also providing what we consider a good use um, in, in order to meet the city's solid waste diversion goals. Um, on December 22nd, it was appealed by the appellant who happens to represent the apartment building across the street. Um, that's who pulled me out today. Um, for the reasons of the impacts that the buyback center created. The buyback center used to actually be located in the shopping center uh, uh, next to this development, but moved over because they got a better rent 
uh, from the gas station on the corner. Uh, uh, so they had to go through the process of the conditional use because they triggered the requirements that they were adjacent to an A or C zone. So basically, I'm here to represent commission's approval, answer any questions you might have, but recommend that the appeal be denied. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go to a public comment, and then we'll take questions and answers, questions and comments from the panel. Uh, first speaker is Paul Martinez. Mr. Martinez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Paul Martinez. I am a witness and customer of JD Recycling, and I oppose the appeal because the recycling center is a benefit to the community. I used to live close by the center, and then, since then I have been a customer. This recycling center is a good, safe, and clean place. I live in the area before the center was open, and I have been seeing homeless pe people, drunks, litter, etc., even before the center was open. So these issues have nothing to do with the recycling center. The problem is that we have three liquor stores too close in the area. So I strongly support the recycling center to keep it open for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Shant Sayan. For the record, my name is Sean Sion. I'm the applicant's representative, honorable ch committee chair and committee members. JD Recycling has been in business at Lakeview Terrace for the last 13 years. During the first 10 years, it was located in the shopping mall parking lot and afterwards moved at a distance of 20 feet to the present location, which is seen as a more secure and compact vacant area of the gas station. After waiting for three years, JD Recycling received unanimous approval of its application by the City Planning Commission. Within a 500 feet radius of the recycling facility, there are 247 apartment units, 45 condominium units, 20 single family dwellings, 94 mobile homes, a large shopping mall, and a church. Most of these residents are customers of the recycling center, which has provided an important service to this neighborhood for the last 13 years and contributes towards the city's goal of reaching zero waste in the near future. This facility was never cited for any non-compliance problems and never had problems with LAPD. The appellant who has started a crusade against this recycling center and has banned his 80 tenants from using the recycling center has a misguided intention of fixing this neighborhood's problems by having the recycling center shut down. Thank you. Thank you. Jiraiyer Narsethian. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jiraiyer Narsethian. I'm the owner of the property uh, since 1980. I own and operate this place. I've seen all the demographic changes in the neighborhood. The, the transient uh, population, they were there since 1980, since I was there. They never left. We're, we're at the corner of a small uh, city. Lake Viteras. We're the only business gas station at the corner surrounded with a shopping center, the only shopping center. So this transit population, they always hang around there. They've always been there. I called several times the police department to stop them drinking around it or do things around it. They come, if they come, they just give them warning. Most of the time they did not respond. It. So this, on my property, there are three businesses, recycle center, gas station, and a tire shop. So this uh, transient population problem it doesn't come from recycle center. They were there for three years. This transient population was almost 30 years they were doing what they're doing today. You close this because of this nonsense, untrue accusation because of recycle center that they are there, it is not true. It is not going to help the problem, like the previous person said, about the liquor stores around it. Within a five minutes walking distance, there are four liquor stores in this location. We believe that's the reason why they are there. So we like to keep the business. We petition people in the neighborhood. They all sign. They want to see the recycle center. It's on file. Uh, Forty of them sign a petition, say that there's a good impact for the neighborhood. And closing a business in an economic time like this, you know, I will suffer, they will suffer. It's a family-operated business. And the people in the neighborhood, they make living out of this recycle center. They recycle their goods and make money every week will suffer. So thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next speaker is Anna. I can't make out the last name, but it's the manager of Foothill Enterprises. Is it Anna? E it's an I and the rest of the name. Good afternoon. My name is Anna, manager for Foothill Enterprises. What's your last name? Can you spell it, please? I R I N E O. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason um, for coming this after is because I had a lot of problems in my building. Um, the tenants give me complaints all the time. I need cleaning every day, every after, outside of my property because the guys for um, table cycle in my properties come in to the um, disposals and take everything see outside of the units. And then when I try to talk to those persons, um, the guys fighting with me. And then I don't know why, but I'm, tr I'm trying to talk to uh, persons to uh, stop for coming to my property. And then I think the um, area is bad. But if you help me this after, um, is so um, better for me because I need, I had bring up prostitution outside of my property. The people coming for, coming for to the recycle and come, come upstairs to my building. Inside to the vacancies available, damage the property outside and it, inside of the unit's vacancy. And then this is the point because the, the people uh, every night call me because the people outside is in the area for my building. And then I'm trying to call the police. The police come in sometimes, not all the times, and give you warnings. But the people is in the outside of the building, inside of the building, and the bus stuff every day, every day. And then that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Noah Strait. Noah Stride uh, right. for Foothill Enterprises. Um, basically, you know, in my mind, this is an issue of public safety. And the question is, you know, what the city is trying to do with creating, uh, re, I guess, recycle centers, you know, if, if, that, if, if that has an impact on the public safety of a particular area, then I think that you need to take that under consideration and not allow the recycling center's use in that area. Now, I have before me the um, conditions of approval, and number 22 says, no recycling center operator shall permit loitering, camping, public begging, consumption of alcoholic beverages, use of illegal narcotics, or any other criminal activity on any premises over which he has control. I have photographs from just this morning and yesterday morning of loitering on the property that we're discussing, of just people, almost people hanging out, drinking from open containers, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, furthermore, um, in the in the findings, and I'll just quote one section. It says, you know, that the project still needs to prevent its its existence from negatively impacting upon the public welfare. We have a big homeless problem in the area. Will shutting this down solve that entire problem? Absolutely not. Will it help the problem? 100%. You have homeless people all day long that are coming to the recycling center, dropping their stuff off, coming back, they get a little money, they go to the liquor store, they buy alcohol, they hang out in front of my building, they hang out inside of my building. We've even caught them, as you mentioned before, you know, engaging in lewd acts uh, in front of our property. Uh, they, they harass the tenants. We have had people from this recycling center come into our property and sell narcotics. So I'm asking for your help. If you want to protect the public safety, this is 80 units, 80 units, all two bedrooms, it's all families. I'm asking for your help to, I guess, disallow uh, the recycling center um, at the gas station. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriela Ramos.
hello. I represent Four Hill Enterprises, property supervisor. And I'm actually the one receiving the phone call from all the tenants, from all these families concerned about the recycling center. Um, all these people is just coming in, you know, as Noah mentioned, just selling their stuff, using their money to buy alcohol, drugs. Um, I have, you name it, I receive every phone call for every family, and it's every time it's the same thing. It is people, you know, um, mothers calling me that their kids are watching these people having sex, drinking, using drugs in front of them, selling drugs to their own, you know, to their own kids. So every tenant I have, every new tenant that I have, I have to receive a phone call, you know, in regards to the same, same issue, the recycling center, and these people just hanging out, um, harassing all, all of our tenants, families, kids, and, um, and we pretty much, you know, have the major problem, which is the recycle center that they go, they sell the stuff, and they use their money. So we do have a problem, and we do need your help. Um, I have tenants moving out of the property. They do like the property. It's a quiet. We try to keep it quiet, clean. Um, you know, we try our tenants to follow the rules, and but it, it's not our tenants. Every time I have received a phone calls, I always, you know, ask questions. Who is it? You know, who is hanging out? And everyone refers to the recycling center. It's the same people that afternoon, I've been there myself, you know, at 7 o'clock, just to see the movement, just to see the people, and it's like the same, same, same ones, just going, selling the stuff, using their money, and hanging out around the, the property. So I think pretty much it's the same, same thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Faisal Alceri from Councilmember Alarcón's office. Good afternoon, Council Members. Faisal Alceri for Councilmember Alarcón. Um, what I'd like to suggest to you is a compromise to address the loitering issues at this location and uh, maintaining a business at the site as well that's been in operation for approximately 10 years. Uh, the compromise would be to deny this appeal and approve the City Planning Commission's actions with modified conditions. Uh, the modified conditions would be to include video cameras. Uh, or. Uh, Actually, I should just read them. Video cameras shall be included as part of a security plan. Number two, LAPD shall have access to video tape to assess loitering concerns. Number three, property shall maintain a security guard on the premises during recycling hours of operations. And number four, a one-year review to assess whether or not the recycling center is the actual uh, I guess attraction for the loitering uses that are that are being uh, proclaimed. Um, I think that that would address both parties, and the council member is definitely sensitive to the issues raised by the property um, uh, manager at the adjacent site, and that's something that we want to work with LAPD to fix. Uh, but it's unclear whether or not the recycling center is is the main uh, driving force of some of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call staff up, please? So you have recommended that we deny the appeal. Um, there is testimony today that there's been a number of issues associated with this property, whether it's loitering, drugs, prostitution. Uh, are, are there are there police reports to um, that would um, acknowledge these activities? Well, well, my staff report. Um, I did contact the police department on two occasions about the crime in the area, mainly as a result of a, 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 a conglomerate of uses in the area, liquor stores, um, markets, and things of that nature, and a large homeless population. So while the police department said that this type of use has its own type of dynamic, it is, in, in taking context with liquor stores and other types of uses, a concern of the police department, but they did not have any police reports that were attributed specifically to the buyback center. So there were no police reports attributed specifically to the recycling center? To the recycling center in its current location. Okay. All right. So, but, um, but I want to make it very clear, this buyback center moved 30 feet to the north to this location. They still have a buy right to go back to the shopping center without any kind of conditional use. Okay. So they can go back to their old location with by right. Um, so that doesn't alleviate the concerns of the appellant. Gotcha. And the council member for the area, Council Member Robert Cohen's office, recommended four conditions. Have you reviewed those? Yes, are I they have. part of your the CUP already or are they, they well, new? 
Two of them are located and already part of the commission action. Which one? Which the one security those? camera uh -huh. is, is located, the su surveillance, surveillance um, and that would have the tapes available to the police department, and they would have to have those tapes, I believe, um, stored for a month. So you'd have to, they'd have to have a month of tapes for the police to be able to review. And then a security guard was required, too. So that's three. Uh, and a plan approval is required for six months. So what I would recommend is to go along with the council office's requirement for a plan approval after a year. I was more, commission was more restrictive. They wanted to see a plan approval after six months. Okay, the, the council member's office didn't mention that one. But you want a plan but approval after six that. months? They thought they mentioned the plan approval, but maybe they didn't. No. Okay, so it was only one of the conditions was the surveillance cameras. Okay, so let's back up. Okay. Let's start all over. Okay. Uh, video cameras shall be included as part of the security plan. Is that part of the existing CUP? Yes, it is. Okay. The LAPD shall have access to videotape to assess loading programs. That's part of, so that's two, yes. That's part, that of, is part, the, of, part of the same condition. You yes. just mentioned a plan approval after six months. That would be new, and we would incorporate that today? Yeah, well, that's in there now as uh, six months, but the council office expressed to me on the phone that they would have, they wanted to see something a little longer, maybe a year. So that's yeah. why it was in my brain. Okay. Okay, so he, if he can speak. A year, six months? expertise of this committee as well as uh, Mr. Glick if okay. he feels that six months is, a, is enough time to ascertain some of these issues uh, yeah. but you know by all means six months um, I think one year might give LAPD and the okay. county folks of mental let, health. Let me ask let me ask the planning department what's but, typical a year or six months what's typical what's your common practice? Well it's Typical for a year, but remember that's a business that hasn't started yet. This business is in operation, so I figured six months okay, was enough for six time. Months. Was if enough time. Yeah, I, I, if that's uh, okay with my colleague here, um, uh, six months, and then uh, the property shall maintain a security guard during hours of recycling operation. That is not in there now. That is not on there. No, it's okay. Not. That's been recommended by the council member's office mm -hmm. and so I would ask that the property owner the business owner I, I mean we're going to impose that condition I, I don't think it's going to be an undue burden on the business so we will go ahead and recommend this as part of the recommendation from the council office to include that in there so that is that one additional item on here correct yes it is okay I'll get it okay okay any other questions, comments, Mr. Krukorin? Just because I'm new here, uh, for, <laughs> for clarification then, if I, if I can, a couple of things let me clarify. One, no police recommendation against this because of impact on crime in the area, right? Okay, so the, the, the options before us would be uh, to grant the appeal, in which case the appellant would go back to their existing location by right, or to deny the appeal and accept this recommendation, which would have additional security considerations attached to it to try to mitigate the adverse impacts. Yes. Okay. Technically, you'd be granting the appeal in part but by adding that security condition. Okay. So that's why I was confirming with the city attorney. You're, you're granting the appeal in part, technically. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. So I would move that we uh, deny the appeal and sustain the CPC decision and add the additional condition as outlined by planning staff. It, yes, it would attorney. Terry Kaufman was yes. It would be to grant in part and deny in part. Grant in part and deny in part okay. uh, with that additional condition as worked out by the local council member's office. Okay. And uh, I'll move that. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Krikorian. So ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe we are now going into public comment. Is that correct, Roberto? Uh, yes, Councilman. Okay, so our first speaker is Barbara Monahan Burke. Hello again, Barbara Money and Burke, Studio City Neighborhood Council. Um, to do with uh, studying the SB 1818, I, I really, uh, further, I really commend Councilman Krikorian for suggesting that, and I hope uh, Councilman Wiesar will support that also. 
We have urban, suburban, and rural areas in the way SB 1818 from the state is handed down to us, uh, just really considers it as urban for us, and it just doesn't work for the rest of the communities. So I hope you will go forward with that, and I, I ask that if you do, that you um, not only have Studio City Neighborhood Council members on your task forces, but those from other neighborhood councils too, because we're on the ground floor on all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lisa Sarkin. Lisa Sarkin, Studio City Neighborhood Council. You know, we, we find that the, most of the CEQA findings and the exemptions are just flawed. We, we can't understand how certain parts of any ordinance are categorically exempted all the other big words that nobody ever knows what any of it means. And, and as Mr. Kokorian has already stated, we need the whole entire SB 1818 revamped. I don't know what was wrong with that judge, but how he could have thought that only those two parts of SB 1818 go way past the law. Our menu goes way past the law. Everything in it goes way past the law. And frankly, for most of us, we think that moderate housing, especially for sale, should not be allowed to include later on, once they finish the building, the right for those owners to take those moderate units that were supposed to be for sale and rent them because it's not profitable to sell them off. That's how it, the law has been explained to us countless times, and I think that's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to do. And as for Studio City, I can tell you now that the two SB 1818 buildings literally dis destroyed 52 affordable units. 52 affordable units. One building was replacing 15 affordable units with 28 other units with two affordable. And that building is, hasn't been completed. It's been sitting there. And now it's cracked. So I don't know what's going to happen with that building. The other one is our 58 unit building where only six are affordable. So that 37 units were taken away, affordable units. Nice buildings. I know you can't stop people from doing what they want basically on their properties if they want to tear down old ones and put up new. But this law only takes away affordable housing, especially in the areas that we want people to be more mixed. We have luxury condos that are sitting there empty and eight affordable units out of the whole thing. That's just pitiful. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Barry Johnson. And after Barry Johnson is Doug Haynes. Barry Johnson, Studio City stakeholder. Um, I've got a board here that has about 12 different pamphlets that the city planning department prints and makes available to, the, to developers, um, telling them how they can go about doing certain things and getting around certain things. I would like to know where the brochure is called, a brochure, I think there should be a brochure called, How to Retain the Scope and Character of the Neighborhood that Surrounds My Home. One, that brochure doesn't exist. Um, and the answer is not contained in the baseline mansionization ordinance. The same 4,000 square foot homes that are adjacent to my 1,700 square foot home today could, that were built four years ago could still be built today under the 60% BMO. Um, it just it doesn't seem right that I can be surrounded by a tunnel of building mass in a home that's been there for decades. And it, seem, it seems, again, like, you know, the middle class in the community, the middle, the middle guy, I mean, I don't consider myself poor and I don't consider myself rich, yet there's no protection for me. There's a lot of protection for people that want to build big, and there's always protections for those that are poor. But where is something that's protecting me in the community I've lived in for years? And um, it, it seems like even um, provisions like the RFA provision in the BMO, it's like hurdle after hurdle to get anywhere, and it just seems like a, a cause going nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Haynes, and after Doug Haynes is Lucille Saunders. Okay. 
Hi, Doug Haynes. I'm a member of the East Hollywood Neighborhood Council. And regarding the uh, project that I briefly referenced previously. Excuse me just one moment, Mr. Haynes. I just want to caution um, the council members again that this is a quasi-judicial matter. It's a project that's going to come before you. And I believe that there are due process concerns with hearing testimony from somebody when the matter is not before the committee. If Mr. Haynes has general comments that he wants to make and use some other project, I mean, that's fine, but I have serious concerns about due process of individuals who um, are not here today and discussing a project that involves them. Great. Thank you. And again, it's my understanding of this law that uh, under public comment, people have the right to comment on anything they wish so long as it's within the the um, body's um, guidelines of not obnoxious and et cetera, offensive, et cetera. So we have the right, in my opinion, Thank you. to discuss That's that. Called. We will look for, uh, we will uh, try to determine that at the next meeting. For now, that's the ruling for the chair. Thank you very much. That's called the Brown Act. And uh, you do have a right to speak out on anything you please. Um, but that really shows the uh, failure of this ordinance because the city planning commission is the last avenue of appeal on a density bonus unless it's section 245 so the members of this committee will not be hearing an appeal on the project that i mentioned and there are many other issues with this ordinance that have been mentioned but i also i would like to point out the notification um, only the adjacent property owners are notified of an approval there is no public hearing and if there's an appeal, only the owner and the applicant, which is usually one and the same, is notified of the appeal. Unless you request in writing, but it doesn't specify who you request in writing to, to be notified if there's appeal. So the neighbors aren't aware of the approval. They're not aware of an appeal if one should occur. And in the last case, the project we had, city planning determined that they didn't even have to send out a letter to adjacent property owners letting them know that approval had been made. They just decided on their own that they didn't have to do that. And until we found out after the fact, they said the appeal period was over. And you couldn't even bring up the issue. And so we were fortunately able to get Councilman uh, Garcetti's office to go in and say, no, the law doesn't allow you to just approve something and have it in secret, and then no one can appeal it. So there are many problems with this ordinance that need to be corrected. And there are simple solutions. Economic justification is valid under state law for determining whether or not you can approve a density bonus. And yet, this implementing ordinance doesn't carry that. City planning doesn't do anything to try to effectuate that, even though they have the opportunity to. And as I mentioned previously, if there's a significant impact, for some reason planning goes around that significant impact and pretends it's, it's not significant. So you basically have no rights and it's approved. Thank you. Thank you. And I know this gentleman here, you had asked to speak and put a comment. Did you speak already? No, and I misplaced your card. So, yeah, I'm, I apologize. I, I know you were speak. You had signed up to speak for number two, and then um, you asked to speak under public comment, and I can't seem to find your card. So you are Kerry Brazeman. Kerry Brazeman, right. Okay. Uh, LA, LA Neighbors United. Just a couple of, of brief comments, because most of my uh, concerns have already been addressed. Uh, thank you, first of all, Mr. Chairman. I've never had the opportunity to speak before you for your help with Elephant Hill. It's really appreciated in maintaining some, some family needed green space in a part of town that is deprived of, of open and green space. Um, thanks also to the committee for recognizing that we have a problem here and that while the state mandates we have an SB 1818 policy, the state does not mandate we have an ordinance that you can drive a truck through. And uh, I really appreciate your interest and your willingness to coming back and taking a look at this. Um, in, in, in particular, the fact that this is resulting in an accelerated loss of affordable units, particularly RSO units, because it's so easy to get the development incentives. Uh, but that consequence is something that we're paying for in other ways given the loss of middle income and low income folks or the exodus of, of middle income and low income folks from the city of Los Angeles. Just one point about uh, CEQA and, 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 and CEQA review and the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong. Relative to individual projects, and it's, it's been discussed here, individual projects are subject to environmental review when there are incentives at stake. And um, as far as we know, the city is, is, is uh, complying with that and reviewing individual projects. 
uh, either with MNDs or with EIRs. But when there are existing project approvals and an applicant comes back and wants to layer on a density bonus with incentives on top of existing project approvals, as was the case with, with uh, as has been the case with many projects, that does trigger uh, environmental review or a fresh environmental review because uh, there may be negative environmental impacts uh, due to the density bonus and the incentives that may not be mitigatable and we won't know those unless we do fresh environmental review. So I just wanted to point that out uh, as, as, as a matter of fact. But uh, again, thank you for your attention to this issue. Well, thank you very much. Um, so with that, uh, I believe that's the last item on our agenda. Is that correct, Mr. Uh Yes, Councilman. Okay, so motion to adjourn. Second. So ordered. Thank you. Thank you today for all your comments as well. It's been very informative.